In this video, we're going to begin exploring galvanic cells, which convert the free chemical energy built into a spontaneous redox reaction into electrical energy in the form of a voltage and or a current. So before we get into the specifics of a galvanic cell, let's take another look at a spontaneous redox reaction. This one between copper metal and aqueous silver cations. So the solution that you see right here, the colorless solution, is aqueous silver nitrate. And the redox active portion of this solution are the silver plus cations. And here we have a copper wire, and that is copper metal. If we place that copper wire inside the silver nitrate solution, initially it looks like not much is happening, but over time we end up with a blue solution and some silver colored metal in the reaction mixture. This blue solution, the blue, is due to aqueous copper 2 plus ions. And as you may have guessed by now, the silvery metal, well, that's silver zero or elemental silver. So evidently, what's happening here is an oxidation of the copper to copper 2 plus. Notice that the oxidation number of copper goes from zero to positive two and a reduction of the silver one cations to elemental silver, silver zero. So electrons are being transferred. This is an electron transfer or redox process. And the question that galvanic cells really try to answer is, could we somehow force an electrical current to flow over a macroscopic distance as this reaction takes place, rather than the electron transfer happening at a very, very tiny scale, for example, between the copper and silver atoms? And the answer is yes, and galvanic cells are designed to force current to flow through a wire in order for a spontaneous redox reaction to take place. So the driving force for that electron flow, for the current, is the free energy change built into the fact that copper wants to, quote unquote, transfer its electrons to silver plus to produce copper two plus and silver metal. Let's move now to defining what we mean by a galvanic cell. A galvanic cell is defined as an electrochemical cell in which a spontaneous redox reaction takes place. And the word spontaneous here is key. A galvanic cell powers current or voltage via a spontaneous redox reaction. That's the hallmark of a galvanic cell. We'll look at a specific design for a galvanic cell in a second, but the high level idea here is that we're converting chemical energy into electrical energy. Every galvanic cell includes two what are called half cells, and you'll sometimes hear these referred to as electrodes as well. And in each half cell, a half reaction occurs. And we've talked previously about half reactions in the context of analyzing redox reactions. A half reaction is a pure oxidation or reduction event. And in the case of this copper-silver situation, for example, we can identify that the copper metal is being oxidized to produce copper 2 plus, and the silver plus is being reduced to produce silver metal. The way we set up a galvanic cell, these half reactions are physically separated in space. This means that the electrons that are lost from the copper metal in the oxidation event have to travel through a wire before they can arrive at the silver plus cations to effect reduction. And this current we can use to light up an LED or charge a phone or do any of the other variety of things we might want to do with current and voltage. Now one more important definition before we move to the components of a galvanic cell, the cathode and the anode. So these half cells are given special names depending on where reduction and oxidation occur. Oxidation, by definition, occurs in the anode. The anode is the electrode or half cell in which oxidation occurs. So for example, in a copper-silver galvanic cell, the copper-containing half cell would be the anode. This is where oxidation is occurring. Reduction occurs in the cathode. And so here again, if we think about a copper-silver galvanic cell, reduction would occur in the silver half cell, and that would be the cathode. And these terms cathode and anode are also related to other types of ionic movements in the galvanic cell, as we'll see on the next slide. 
A useful mnemonic for this is red cat. This reminds us that reduction occurs in the cathode and an ox, reminding us that oxidation occurs in the anode. All right, let's now take a look at the typical construction of a galvanic cell. And there's kind of a lot going on here, so we're going to take it one at a time. Now, this is a copper-silver galvanic cell. On the left-hand side, we have a strip of copper metal immersed in a copper 2 plus solution, copper 2 nitrate solution, specifically. Notice that those are the two components of the oxidation half reaction, copper metal and copper 2 plus. On the right hand side, we have a strip of silver metal immersed in a solution of silver nitrate. And notice here that the silver metal and silver cation are the two components of the reduction half reaction that we looked at previously. And so if we're going to, for example, reduce Ag plus to Ag metal, we need a source of electrons to do that. And that can come from copper metal, but those electrons have to travel across a wire to go from the copper side to the silver side. And this is the beauty of a galvanic cell. We can put any old external circuit in here and provided the voltage that this cell provides is sufficient and the current is sufficient, we can power an external circuit using this device. Now, there's one more thing we need to talk about. If we think about what happens to the charges as the redox reaction runs, well, oxidation is occurring on the left, right? And so, as we can see here, there are copper two plus ions going into solution and electrons flowing through this wire. At the same time, there are silver plus ions coming onto the silver metal. So we're losing positive charge from the right-hand side and gaining positive charge on the left-hand side. There's a charge mismatch here. We'll end up with positive charge buildup on the left and negative charge buildup on the right. And if you have any experience with electrical devices, you'll realize pretty quickly this is actually a capacitor Set up. We've set up a situation where we're sort of storing charge, positive charge on the left and negative charge on the right. And this isn't going to lead to a battery situation. The entire voltage associated with this spontaneous redox reaction is going to be stored in this charge separation. To fix that problem, we need a piece of glassware that allows ions to flow from one side to the other, from one half cell to the other. And this is what's known as a salt bridge. The salt bridge consists of a porous plug that allows ions to pass through and a solution inside the bridge. There are porous plugs on both sides and a solution inside the bridge, often containing additional unreactive ions, Na plus and NO3 minus in this example, that just travel to ensure charge balance. So recall that we said positive charge would build up over here in the absence of the salt bridge. What happens though is that negatively charged anions will flow toward this half cell to neutralize the positive charge that's being built up as the copper metal converts to copper two plus. Likewise, if we think about the right hand side, we said negative charge would build up over here as the silver plus ions are brought out of solution and plate onto the silver metal. To counterbalance that loss of positive charge, Na plus ions will flow this way and will end up maintaining charge neutrality. This allows electrons to flow through the wire and a fixed voltage to be delivered to our external circuit without any of this problematic capacitance effect. Now, we can notice a neat thing now that we've talked about the salt bridge about why the place where oxidation occurs is called the anode and the place where reduction occurs is called the cathode. Notice that anions such as NO3 minus flow toward the anode as the cell operates and cations flow toward the cathode as the cell operates. And so we see now why these terms sound similar. Anions flow toward the anode and cations flow toward the cathode. And in fact, this is the origin of the terms anion and cation. All right. And so just to kind of summarize things, it's important to note that electrons are going to flow from the anode where oxidation occurs to the cathode 
where reduction occurs, and so our net direction of electron flow is from left to right on this diagram through our external circuit. We're going to have copper ions released into solution as oxidation of the copper metal occurs, and at the same time we're going to have NO3 minus anions to balance the charge of those copper two cations so that everything remains electrically neutral. That's everything going on at the anode. On the cathode side, we're going to have silver plus reduced to silver metal by the electrons coming in from the external circuit. And at the same time, sodium plus cations are going to flow in to counterbalance the developing negative charge of the nitrate anions as the silver plus leaves solution. So the salt bridge here is a critical ingredient, but the overall idea, the big picture of a galvanic cell is that we're separating the two half reactions in space. Oxidation is occurring in the left-hand electrode and reduction on the right, and when we link them together with a wire using the salt bridge to ensure charge balance, electrons flow spontaneously because there's a driving force here. Copper wants to reduce silver plus. And so it, in a sense, pushes electrons toward the silver half cell. An equivalent way to think about this is that the silver half cell pulls electrons towards itself, since the silver plus cation, to some extent, wants to be reduced. 